good. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's uh, good to see you all for this uh, first uh, research seminar of the new semester. Um, you're very welcome. It's lovely to see so many people from all over the place. And, and it's a great delight to welcome Jordan Hammond um, to lead our first seminar with his presentation. Um, Jordan's been doing a, an incredible amount of work um, in his research. And so um, he's presenting part of that today. Um, the third blessing, John Wesley and the sanctification of the mind. So Jordan, we're delighted that you are presenting this today and I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you. Are, are you able to unmute? Right. No. Yeah, I just had to unmute myself. Am I okay now? Good. Thanks very much, Julie. And thank you all for taking the time to be here this afternoon, UK time and various times in different parts of the world. So it's wonderful to see faces scattered around the globe with us today. Uh, before I jump into the presentation, it might be helpful just to say a few short words about the backgrounds to it. The origins of the paper lie in a substantial portion of one of the chapters of my first PhD student, David Stark, who's here with us. Hi, David. And uh, he completed his thesis in 2011. The title of it was The Peculiar Doctrine Committed to Our Trust, Ideal and Identity in the First Methodist Holiness Revival, 1758 to 1763. Now, a few years ago, David asked me if I'd consider working with him on turning this material into a chapter to which, um, or to, into an article to which I agreed. And this finally transpired over this uh, last summer. So the foundation of what I'm presenting today is in David's thesis, without which you wouldn't be hearing this presentation. Um, at the same time, I've thoroughly revised and expanded it. Uh, I've read all the sources that David used and uh, added some more. And uh, so it's, it's generally a, a mutual work of his and mine. Now, in seeing the title of the paper, you may have thought, hmm, what is, there was a third blessing uh, in John Wesley and early Methodism. Um, if that's what you thought, don't worry, you're in good company. Uh, most Wesley scholars I've mentioned to that I've been working on this have never heard of the third blessing in early Methodism. So I've intensively been talking to the saints who appear in this paper over the last couple of months. And so I'm excited to have the opportunity to share it with you and uh, look forward to your feedback. It has some church history in it, some theology, some Christian spirituality, and even some Bible. So uh, I hope there's something of interest to uh, each of you. Um, lastly, I'll just note that the full paper is about 18,000 words. So I've therefore had to savagely chop it down for this presentation. Um, I hope I hope, I think it still fits together okay. In a few places, I'll quickly summarize portions of the paper that have been cut. So on to uh, the presentation. It was finally happening some 20 years after the beginning of the evangelical revival, the long awaited day of Pentecost had finally arrived in early Wesleyan Methodism in the view of its co-founder, John Wesley. Justification by grace through faith resulting in the new birth, initial sanctification and assurance of salvation had long been central to Wesley's theology and experience of the early Methodists. The movement was becoming more solidified, but its full Pentecostal potential was still regarded by Wesley as being unrealized. Since the very beginning, Wesley had hoped for even more. This desire began to be fulfilled through widespread testimonies to experiences of entire sanctification amongst the Methodist people. In the midst of such proliferation, he recalled, to, he recalled his brother Charles's prophecy of many years ago, that your day of Pentecost is not fully come, but I doubt not it will, and you will then hear a person sanctified as frequently as you do now of persons justified. This extended day of Pentecost was aided by an immensely practical though little discussed revision to John Wesley's doctrine of Christian perfection, 
regarding its immiscibility. That is that it could be lost, but also regained and was therefore a non-static relational dynamism that made room for Methodists to maintain integrity and faith in the wake of backsliding. Prior to this modification, Wesley expect, expected the entirely sanctified would sin no more and therefore stressed the process of sanctification and the rarity of attainment of Christian perfection. A missability along with an increased insistence from Wesley and his preachers on the instantaneous and secondness elements of sanctification, together with stress on God's invitation that it be received now, helped pave the way for rather suddenly experiences and testimonies of entire sanctification to occur in mass in the late 1750s and early 1760s. For this reason, the period may be referred to as the first Wesleyan holiness revival. In the closing paragraph of the 12th installment of his published journal, Wesley assessed in 1762, his brother's prediction was being fulfilled. Any unprejudiced reader may observe that it, referring to the day of Pentecost, was now fully come. And accordingly, we did hear a person sanctified in London and in most other parts of England and in Dublin and in many other parts of Ireland as frequently as of persons justified. Not only was the second blessing of entire sanctification attested to in the holiness revival, but some claimed a third blessing, the sanctification of the mind. Centered in London, these witnesses as early Methodists who experienced and testified to sanctification were often called, declared that the gift of sanctification of the mind included freedom from wandering thoughts that distract the mind from continual focus on God. Many testified to complete deliverance from wandering thoughts, while some admitted short lapses into them. At the time of the holiness revival, Wesley was encouraging Methodists towards freedom from wandering thoughts and a constant focus of the mind on God. In light of his questions to a Methodist woman in 1761, this can be seen as a natural development of his theology. He asked her, is your mind always stayed on God? Do your thoughts never wander from him in prayer, in business, or in traveling? Is your mind always stayed on God is a hint at the, um, the biblical kind of inspiration. Um, if you, it, you may uh, only think of it if you know your King James Bible well, but uh, that's a little uh, insight into where I'll go. These questions were of utmost urgency to the witnesses as revealed in their testimonies discussed in this paper. Most biographies of Wesley, studies of early Methodist history, and treatments of the Wesleyan doctrine of salvation make no mention of the third blessing. This paper details Wesley's changing views on sanctification of the mind and freedom from wandering thoughts. It provides the most comprehensive analysis to date of these subjects and the contents of letters addressed to Wesley on desiring and attaining mind sanctification. Sanctification in the Wesleyan Holiness Revival. John Wesley preached an evangelical doctrine of instantaneous entire sanctification, subsequent to conversion, a teaching in common with his brother Charles before the Holiness Revival. Charles uh, came out against um, the teaching of in instantaneous entire sanctification, uh, which I won't have space to get into, but we can talk about that uh, if you want after the paper. Um, as well as the wider body of early Methodist preachers. Advocating a radical optimism of grace, Wesley not only preached forgiveness from the guilt and power of sin through justification by faith, but also championed a doctrine of scriptural holiness as occurring through an event and continued process of deliverance from the very root of it. Liberation from all inbred corruption, from all the remains of the carnal mind, from the whole body of sin. Citing Methodist testimonies from the early 1760s, particularly 652 members of our London society who were exceeding clear in their experience and of whose testimony I could see no reason to doubt, Wesley reflected in 1784 that all who believe they are sanctified declare with one voice that the change was wrought in a moment. I cannot but believe that sanctification is commonly, if not always, an instantaneous work. 
In his sermon, The Repentance of Believers of 1767, Wesley argued for the importance, if not implying the salvific necessity of a second change. Then only the evil root, the carnal mind is destroyed and inbred sin subsists no more. But if there be no such second change, if there be no instantaneous deliverance after justification, if there be none but a gradual work of God and that there is a gradual work, none denies, then we must be content as well as we can to remain full of sin till death. And if so, we must remain guilty till death, continually deserving punishment. To one of these witnesses of the perfection to which I preach, Wesley cooperatively encouraged, is it, it is exceeding certain that God did give you the second blessing, properly so called. He delivered you from the root of bitterness from inbred sin as well as actual sin. A second blessing terminology appears in at least six times in Wesley's letters, showing that the co-founder of Methodism and not any later figure in the American Methodist or holiness traditions introduced the language and expectation to Christian spirituality. As a result, it was naturally adopted more widely in Methodism and was even the term was even used by the evangelical Anglican John Newton, uh, an opponent of it. Second blessing was one of many terms Wesley used interchangeably to describe the instantaneous gift within the process of Christian holiness. A distinctive instantaneous spiritual experience for believers was an essential element of his theology of full salvation or Christian perfection which in his mind was the impetus and hallmark of Methodist identity that he famously called the grand depositum, which God has lodged with the people called Methodists, as well as the Methodist testimony and the peculiar doctrine committed to our trust. Whereas the gift of entire sanctification provided a pure heart free from all the remains of inbred sin, the gift of the sanctification of the mind was said to have enabled uninterrupted focus on God, free from thoughts that may wander, even towards lesser, albeit innocent, subjects. So looking now at the early Methodist testimonies to the sanctification of the mind, the uh, context of the testimonies. In 1781, John Wesley devoted the lion's share of the letters published in the fourth volume of the Arminian magazine to accounts of those seeking the same or testifying to the sanctification of the mind. His enthusiastic introduction to the grouping of letters leaves no doubt of his general strong approval of them on the whole. He wrote, I am persuaded the preceding magazines contain such a collection of letters as never appeared before in the English tongue. I mean, for the depth of genuine Christian experience, but I concede, I conceive none of them exceed and not many of them equal the following, which I shall give the readers in their native simplicity. This is corroborated by the nine instances in which Wesley briefly commented on the letters, none of which question the authenticity of the spiritual experiences that are described and are taken as a whole overwhelmingly positive. Likewise, Wesley in his 1781, a short history of the people called Methodists same year as he published uh, the letters in the Armenian magazine, he recalled there the holiness revival as a great work of God. Two decades after the revival, Wesley had settled on a largely positive view of it. Wesley published over 60 letters in the 1781 magazine, the vast majority of which relate to the holiness revival. And most of these letters are concentrated in the two years of 1761 and 1762. Using a conservative account, folk count focusing on explicit accounts or statements of individuals receiving the third blessing, we've identified 13 individuals in six different letters. Additionally, there were at least eight Methodists who were either seeking it or for whom it is uncertain whether they had obtained it or who describe a mind continually focused on God and describe freedom from wandering thoughts without explicitly claiming this as a third blessing. All of the letters uh, are addressed to Wesley and 90% of them are written by women. 
Nonetheless, of the 13 people who are named as recipients of the third blessing, eight are men and five are women. Although the data is limited on the ages of participants, the extant evidence suggests that it was predominantly a movement of young adults. The persons giving these accounts were ordinary, deeply committed Methodists. Apart from their testimonies to the third blessing, we know little to almost nothing about most of these 13 individuals. Scriptural and theological sources. In the same way that early Methodist testimonies of justification and of entire sanctification present patterns and an impression of uniformity, testimonies of the sanctification of the mind include similar outlines and repeated language no doubt informed by the communal proximities in which these Methodists experienced it. The testimony of a brother Marston may serve as a base model. Ever since I received a clean heart, I was convinced that I wanted a farther power in order to stay my mind constantly on God. And a few days since, as I was walking, I said, Lord, I want to have my mind so deeply fixed that nothing may hinder it nothing may hinder me for a moment. It was answered, if thou canst believe, it shall be according to thy faith. I replied, Lord, I do believe. And since then, my soul goes out continually to God, nor does anything I do or meet with hinder my intercourse with him. An essential question for Wesley and early Methodists is raised by Marston's account. What is the biblical basis for the sanctification of the mind? Marston alludes to Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him per in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Having a mind fixed or stayed on God, ubiquitous in these testimonies, was read as a scriptural promise by the witnesses. Three of the most explicit statements in this regard are Daniel Carney, Jane Catherine March, and Emma Moon. Seeking to be freed from wandering thoughts, Daniel Carney one morning pleaded that promise from Isaiah 26, three, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And he was re immediately released from them. The enemy tried to stop Emma Moon, um, strip Emma Moon of the third blessing by suggesting there is no scripture for this, but she found these words ever before me. And I knew they were a scriptural promise I will keep his soul in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on me. After six weeks of prayer, she was delivered from this trial to steadiness of mind. Having one's mind fixed on God so that it is no longer disrupted by wandering thoughts was the concise shared definition of advocates of the third blessing. The New Testament text um, I think you won't be surprised here that is most often referred or alluded to in the third blessing accounts is Philippians 2 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Mrs. M.W., uh, and I should say all the letters as published in the Armenian magazine just use the initials of the letter writers, but we've been able to identify quite a few of them, not all of them. Mrs. M.W., a witness to the sanctification of the mind, stated, I feel nothing less than the whole mind that is in Jesus will satisfy my soul. The same longing was the desire of Mrs. E.S., Mary Bosonke, and Mrs. H. Clark. It was an ideal John Wesley was encouraging in this same period of time, declaring that gospel holiness is no other than the whole mind which was in Christ Jesus. Jasper J. was propelled towards the third blessing by the Apostle Paul's exhortation in 2 Corinthians 10.5, that every thought should be brought into subjection to the obedience of Christ. In terms of biblical parallels, the most stunning account references the Pauline vision of the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 2.12. Mrs. J. found freedom from her uncertainty and wandering thoughts through a mystical experience corresponding to that of St. Paul. On March 7th, Mrs. J received a clean heart, yet she was greatly tempted and so disturbed by wandering thoughts that she began to doubt whether she was saved from sin or not. 
but on the 2nd of April, she was, as it were, caught up into the third heavens. She thought her soul lay prostrate before the Lord, and she cast her crown at his feet. And ever since, her mind has been so stayed on him that she has been kept in perfect peace. One wonders how, for the witnesses, Isaiah 26.3 became the scriptural foundation for the third blessing. While 2 Corinthians 10.5, and especially Philippians 2.5, were amongst Wesley's favorite verses of scripture, he rarely referred to Isaiah 26.3. Although, as already noted in a 1761 letter, to, he asked a Method Methodist woman, is your mind always stayed on God? An important earlier allusion to Isaiah 26.3 is found in uh, his 1742 publication, The Character of a Methodist, one of his earliest and most popular apologies for Methodism. Expounding on how a Methodist prays without ceasing, Wesley described his scriptural view of a perfect Christian. Whether he lie down or rise up, God is in all his thoughts. He walks with God continually having the loving eye of his mind still fixed upon him and everywhere seeing him that is invisible. The hymns of Charles Wesley form a definitive source for the theology of the witnesses. Isaiah 26.3 and Philippians 2.5 are prominent in hymns and sacred poems, both the volume published in 1742 and the two volume uh, edition published in 1749. The former collection contains a hymn on Philippians 2.5 that connects having the mind of Christ with Christian perfection. Its 10th stanza references both Philippians 2.5 and Isaiah 26.3. Plant and root and fix in me all the mind that was in thee. Settled peace I then shall find. Jesus is a quiet mind. Hymns and sacred poems being quoted or paraphrased in 10 letters written by seven different female correspondents demonstrates the prevalence of their influence on the seekers of the third blessing. G given that three of the four collections of hymns and sacred poems were published under the names of both John and Charles Wesley, they would have almost certainly been read as representative and communicating the theology of both men. Now to um, the testimonies. Over half of the 13 individuals who testified to mind sanctification are named in the earliest and most important letter in this collection written by Mary Bosenke. It appears that the powerful testimony of John Fox at a London society meeting inspired others towards the third blessing. Fox shared that though he knew he was saved from sin and that he loved God with all his heart, Yet his mind was not always stayed upon him, but he saw this as well as the former blessing was to be received by simple faith. From this time, he continually prayed for an increase of faith, and it was not long before his soul was brought as into the immediate presence of God, who from that hour did every moment keep his heart and mind also. Four others soon testified to having received the same blessing. At the society meeting a week later, Brother Dupe and Brother Marston shared their similar experiences. The former noted that the declarations of his brethren led him to cry out to God for the blessing. About a week later, Mrs. M.W., hearing the blessing, hearing of the blessing given to others, of having their mind continually stayed on God, was moved to cry mightily to him for it. And for Christ's sake, it was given me. The domino effect of these experiences reflects their contagious nature and the now emphasis of John Wesley that was then prevalent. In pleading the promise of Isaiah 26.3, Daniel Carney recalled, I said, why not now, Lord? Thou canst give it me now. Immediately it was to me according to my faith. Carney was embodying the simple teaching that just as with the preceding regenerating and sanctifying gifts, the sanctification of the mind was to be received by faith, to be sought for vigorously, especially in prayer, and first felt in a perceptible spiritual occurrence. 
it was being communicated to Mary Boson Kay as, believe now and you shall have the blessing. Five of the witnesses professed that the third blessing is as different from what they received before, referring to entire sanctification, as that is from justification. The clarity of the experience was a hallmark of it. When receiving mind sanctification, Jasper J felt his power delivering me, I think more clearly than when he took the root of bitterness out of my heart, a reference to his reception of the second blessing. Not only was the experience exceptionally clear to the witnesses, it was superior to that of entire sanctification. While the witnesses could be accused of enthusiasm, of being naive, and to some extent deviating from the theology of the Wesleys, nonetheless, they were clearly devoted Methodists attempting to be faithful to the movement. Indeed, alongside their optimism in God's power and desire to make them free from sin and holy, their spirituality was tempered by a measure of realism. Three ways in which this stands out in their letters is in statements that after receiving the third blessing, they continue or, or expect to continue to grow in grace, that they need the grace of God moment by moment in every moment of their lives, and that they are still tempted. Looking at um, those who are seeking the third blessing and freedom from wandering thoughts. Amongst the 1781 Arme Arminian Magazine letter writers, there were several individuals who were ardently seeking mind sanctification, but did not testify to the fulfillment of the desire. The common hindrances in these cases was the lack of a distinct experience of having received the blessing and struggle with the continuing presence of wandering thoughts. The most prominent person in this regard was Mary Bosenke. Although her letters reveal her deep spiritual experience, she wrote as a frustrated seeker of the third blessing rather than as a contented witness to it. She divulged, many here have now experienced the blessing of having their minds continually stayed on God, but it is not so with me. My mind is still frequently hurried and distressed. And particularly when anyone says, believe now and you shall have this blessing. I am greatly pained for the want of this. If a wider definition of the third blessing is adopted, to mean testimony to freedom from or control over wandering thoughts without the need for an explicit declaration being required that this was a third blessing, then five additional women could be added to the 13 witnesses to mind sanctification. Ruth Hall, Elizabeth Jackson, Mrs. H. Clark, Hannah Harrison, and Dorothea King. Interestingly, two of these women wrote of their union with God not being restricted to their waking hours. In response to an inquisitive Wesley, Ruth Hall wrote, you inquire concerning my dreams. Blessed be God, they are sanctified. I do not always dream, but when I do, I feel much the same as when I am awake. I am still thinking or saying or doing something for God and eternity. And I often find the real teachings of God's spirit in dreams. As a quick example of one of these five women, Elizabeth Jackson's experience is noteworthy for its depth and especially its longevity. In her spiritual autobiography, she narrates her instantaneous conversion, entire sanctification, and intense communion with God in the 10 years that followed. Her rapturous delight in God is reminiscent of similar words of revered Christian mystics in the history of Christianity. She wrote, I found access to the Holy of Holies, where I now see the Trinity in unity. The Lord shineth unto me in perfect beauty. I enjoy an inseparable union with him without intermission. As to her mind, she never had a murmuring thought and was freed from all anxious thoughts. Um, there's a section on the extent of the popular yet controversial movement, which I won't uh, present here. And there's a section as well on John Wesley and the movement in which um, I will give you the three paragraphs, each in a one paragraph bullet point. Um, as noted above, Wesley's two sentence introduction to the series of letters 
and very brief comments on the seven letters suggests his broad endorsement of them. We don't know much about Wesley's engagement with the mind sanctification movement while it was happening, but Emma Moon's account of seeking the third blessing under Wesley's ministry gives a hint that he may have been encouraging it. One of the most ubiquitous themes in the letters are declarations of the letter writers that they are praying for God's blessing on Wesley and that he might advance spiritually, including that he might be entirely sanctified. Wesley's disavowals in the sermon, Wandering Thoughts. Wesley's public response to the third blessing movement was made in the sermon, Wandering Thoughts, published in 1762. Recognizing the implications of these experiences for his teaching of full salvation, he described the issue as a question of no small importance. Before reviewing the sermon, it's worth uh, noting that Wesley, at his most radical point in his 1740 preface to hymns and sacred poems, regarding justified and initially sanctified Christians, he elucidated, they are free from sin. God through the Holy Spirit has cleansed all the thoughts of their hearts. So they are freed from evil thoughts, wandering thoughts and wanderings in prayer. It is God alone who is in all their thoughts and they are in one sense freed from temptations. In the face of fierce criticism in the following year, Wesley moderated the tone and content of his teaching in his sermon, Christian Perfection, making it clear that scripturally perfect Christians are not wholly free from temptation. Yet he still advocated the radical view that Christians are saved in this world from all sin, making them now in such a sense perfect as to not commit sin and to be freed from evil thoughts and evil tempers. In his urging Christian holiness, Wesley often quoted 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Interestingly, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 was the chosen text for Wesley's sermon. But in this case, he interpreted it in a more moderate way than he had done in other writings. He lamented the spiritually taxing situations that some Methodists faced in their quest for the sanctified mind. Wesley immediately established the discourse's correctional tone. Some have vehemently maintained, yea, have affirmed that none are perfected in love unless they were so far perfected in understanding that all wandering thoughts are done away. Unless not only every affection and temper be holy and just and good, but every individual thought which arises in the mind be wise and regular. How many, by not understanding it right, have not only been distressed, but greatly hurt in their souls. He tried to alleviate such frustrations by emphasizing throughout that there are different kinds of wandering thoughts. Some are sinful and require prayer for deliverance from them. Others are natural and entirely innocent. Sinful wandering thoughts are characterized as unbelieving thoughts, murmuring or repining thoughts, proud and vain imaginations, angry, malicious or revengeful thoughts, and earthly and sensual thoughts, which spring from that evil root of unbelief. Constituting volitional sin, they have no place in the sanctified life. As Wesley wrote, wandering thoughts of this kind imply unbelief, if not enmity against God, but both of these he will destroy and bring utterly to an end. And indeed from all sinful wandering thoughts, we shall be absolutely delivered. Else there were, we, we were not saved from all sin. All, all that are perfected in love are delivered from these, else they were not saved from sin. Other wandering thoughts are natural and congruent with Christian perfection. Multitudes of them, said Wesley, are occasioned by the natural union between the soul and the body. These are no more sinful than the motion of blood in our veins and, many, and may consist with perfect innocence. Wandering thoughts may serve to keep a Christian humble, but that does not mean that they are sinful. He explained that sometimes a Christian's imagination does wander from God does, does not wander from God, but the understanding wanders from a particular point it then had in view. <clears throat>
Wandering thoughts may be injected into one's mind by evil spirits, caused by other people, or by our bodies. No such wandering thoughts are sinful so long as they are not indulged. Wesley's continuing interest in mind sanctification. Wesley may have clearly presented his objection to the idea of a mind continually without distraction from God in wandering thoughts, but that sermon was not his last word on the subject. Usually his more open statements about the prospect occurred in the privacy of letters without the careful nuances and qualifications of his sermon. Uh, and here I've, I've had to cut two detailed 1760s examples not long after Wesley published the sermon of Wesley encouraging two women to seek instantaneous deliverance from wandering thoughts, which at the very least was in serious tension with what he had taught in the sermon. At the same time that he filled the 1781 volume of the Arminian magazine with testimonies to seeking and attainment of sanctification of the mind, he wrote a revealing and encouraging letter to Anne Loxdale, the future wife of Thomas Coke. It is certainly possible to have your mind as well as your heart continually stayed upon God. Then he added, this you did experience for some time, and you should be continually expecting to receive it again. These words raise an important question. How is it that one's mind could be continually stayed on God for a limited duration? Are continuance and cessation conflicting ideas? Did Wesley find something holy about searching for a grace that he did not actually believe was attainable? Did he believe it was possible to continually maintain it or that it could be sustained for a time, lost and then regained again? Most of the accounts of sanctification of the mind included a sense of prolongation or permanency. This is a point of vital distinction between Wesley's view and that of most third blessing witnesses and second blessing witnesses for that matter partly on the basis of his use of 1 John 3, 9, Wesley could be interpreted as teaching that once a person is made scripturally perfect, they cannot sin or fall from that state of grace. His early 1760s revision to allow a missability that Christian perfection could, but need not be lost, but could also be regained, permeated his fluid understanding of the possibility of an entirely sanctified mind. One of the few letters on this subject in the 1781 magazine that Wesley made editorial remarks on was in response to an unnamed woman's struggle for the blessing. Like so many of those around her, she said that she wanted to have my religion extend to all my thoughts and at words and actions, my attention to be always fixed on him. Because of the presence of wandering thoughts, she determined, I have not received the blessing which others have. To this letter, Wesley added a short but telling postscript. Is it thus with her now? If this had been written under any of the other testimonies of finding freedom from wandering thoughts, it might have denoted Wesley's general skepticism toward the original claims. However, in correlation with his urging Anne Loxdale to presently expect to again receive the gift she had lost of a mind continually stayed on God, his rhetorical question suggests that this woman and in effect all Methodist readers might experience sanctification of the mind by presently responding to God's invitation for deeper spiritual fullness constantly offered in the ongoing now. Nowness replacing permanency proved to be an operative and enabling feature of Wesley's doctrine. What having an entirely sanctified mind denoted for Wesley was a Christian experiencing and being in a state of intense spiritual consciousness, however lasting, progressive, and potentially sustainable it might be. Some words of conclusion. In terms of being part of the Wesleyan tradition, the language of third blessing may sound foreign to Wesley scholars and present adherents to the tradition. Although third blessing theology has long been widely associated with the gift of speaking in tongues in some Pentecostal traditions, 
And perhaps there is some sense in which the third blessing in early Methodism can be seen in a genealogy of radical doctrine leading to the doctrine of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, in the holiness movement, and that doctrine's transformation into the manifestation of that baptism issuing in glossolalia in the Pentecostal movement. In early Methodism, though, the third blessing was less frequently used than second blessing language. It nonetheless received substantial use and support in the holiness revival of the late 1750s and early 1760s. Well beyond the heat of this revival, Wesley demonstrated a lasting fascination with the possibility of a sanctified mind. As Rex Matthews has noted, there is a widespread consensus in modern culture that rejects the very idea of perfection of any individual person as prima facie evidence of psychotic delusion. Perfectionism is in fact classified as an element of obsessive compulsive disorder by the American Psychological Association. Modern psychology therefore poses a considerable challenge to the Wesleyan doctrine of Christian perfection. And as discussed in this paper, the sometimes accompanying desire in early Methodism of having a mind continually focused on God. In Wesley's view, in which the gradual and instantaneous work was codependent, it was plausible that any work and state of salvific grace could continue for days, weeks, months, years, or even the rest of one's lifetime if they maintained the requisite faith. Regardless of how empowering and glorious any past exper spiritual experiences were, what mattered most to him was that all such grace could abundantly occur in the heart and mind and be continually grown by expectantly responding to God's invitation for the fullness of life in the ongoing present. Instantaneous entire sanctification and employment of second blessing terminology to emphasize this point was distinctive of Wesley and the early Methodists. Wesley also promoted a moment by moment spiritual existence that included the possibility of entire sanctification of the mind in which one might always attain and retain a higher plane of consciousness of the presence and glory of God or, ex or experience a cyclical entering, leaving and re-entering into the innumerable degrees of pure love. To be sure, the idea of mind sanctification was radical in the 18th century, as it is today. The focus of this paper has not been to discuss the sanctification of the mind in relation to Wesley's present day ecclesiological, theological, and spiritual descendants, although it may help pave the way for others to address such questions. This study in historical theology brings to light a little known aspect of Wesley's doctrine of sanctification that historians and theologians may wish to engage in future studies of Wesley's soteriology. It has provided a more detailed account than has previously been offered on the topics of freedom from wandering thoughts, the third blessing, and the sanctification of the mind in early Methodism, with attention given to Wesley's evolving and largely supportive thought. While many of the particularities of Wesley's soteriology may be in contrast or tension with current understandings of the way the human psyche works, and the brain functions, he blazed a trail for how his followers may approach the doctrine of sanctification with reasonable restraint, but limitless faith and hope. Key to this was Wesley's conviction that entire sanctification is immiscible, yet an available blessing at any moment subsequent to justification and regeneration. The desire to live in the highest soteriological possibility in each present moment is at the heart of Wesley's soteriology. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hammond. That's uh, given us food for thought. I, I hope also it's given us uh, food for questions. And uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. I, 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 uh, I thank you for the virtual applause that I see there uh, shown by the, uh, the, the yellow hands. Um, those of you familiar with Zoom will, will know that uh, you can raise a hand through the participation uh, window, but uh, you can also simply uh, show me a hand if you have a question you'd 
like to ask. So I see uh, uh, Julie has a question, so I'll, I'll call on her first. But if you, uh, if you want to raise your hands, others with questions, I'll then call on you in order. Julie. Thank you so much, Jordan. That was a fantastic paper, really interesting. Um, I just wondered when you were looking at the scriptural sources, whether the references in Matthew and Luke to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength had, had any sort of um, reference in the Wesley's writings regarding this, you know, the sanctification of the mind and that sort of um, being part of, of, um, of what Jesus mm -hmm. teaches. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. They're, they're definitely there, um, not quite as prominently as uh, the other scriptures that I mentioned um, and the New Testament, the Corinthians and Philippians passages. But yeah, they are definitely mentioned in connection with mind sanctification. I think I mentioned them in the longer, longer paper, um, just not quite as prominent, especially as um, Philippians 2.5 was. But yeah, they're certainly part of the the wider uh, scriptural uh, repertoire, justification, um, inspiration for the movement. Hmm. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to, I see a hand for, from uh, Steve Wright. And so uh, I will ask Steve if he'd uh, put his question. Uh, thanks, Jordan. Really fascinating. Um, as always, I have two questions. So now I've got to decide which one I ask. Um, <clears throat> I think. I'll, I'll just ask both of them because they're both probably pretty easy. Could, I mean, often we feel like the uh, Wesley studies has been pretty thoroughly explored. Um, can you expand a bit on the reason why this aspect of, uh, you know, well, Wesley's involvement with this discussion has kind of disappeared? Was it just completely eclipsed by the tongues controversy or something like that? Um, and the other question is about um, Wesley's reading of monastic sources and whether or not this kind of feeds into or kind of confirms his warmth towards this kind of understanding of the sanctification of the mind, the full sanctification of the inner self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first question is a really uh, intriguing one that uh, I've thought about a bit. Um, I don't know if there's a complete answer to it. I think part of it is that the letters are fairly hidden um, so they're only in the Arminian magazine, which um, I suppose not all Wesley scholars have paid a lot of attention to. Um, so they haven't been published, at least not most of them, since the 18th century. So they may well have been missed. I think some have, some have very briefly mentioned the Third Blessing Movement as a, a sort of little minority movement within the wider holiness revival. Uh, and those who have mentioned it have generally discussed it very briefly and dismissed it and said, um, Wesley basically uh, definitively uh, came out against it in the sermon, Wandering Thoughts. Um, but I think that the evidence is clear that it's uh, much more complicated than, uh, than that. Um, so I think there may be a sense of um, embarrassment of some that uh, it, or seeing it as too radical uh, impractical um, and if you want to really emphasize um, progressive over instantaneous sanctification then um, you know you're not necessarily going to be uh, inclined to go to uh, these um, witnesses of instantaneous uh, sanctification. Um, yeah, the monastic question, I think that may be the case in a broad sense. Um, I haven't found specific references to Wesley referencing the monastics directly in relation to freedom from wandering thoughts, mind sanctification. Um, there may be something there that I've missed, um, or the, um, or the primary sources from the witnesses themselves. But, um, yeah, there may be inspiration there in the background. Certainly, um, some of the thought is congruent, uh, with, uh, monastic perfectionism. Um, and it may be that it's there in Wesley, but he didn't specifically, 
mention it. Of course, he doesn't always tell us what his sources of inspiration were. Um, although I did um, quote from the character of the Methodist, which um, references uh, character of the Methodist, which references um, Isaiah 26, three, which Wesley says was um, inspired by uh, Clement of Alexandria's description of Christian perfection. Um, so there's at least that link to ancient Christianity um, there. But um, the key um, kind of inspirations, at least for the witnesses themselves, were, I think, from John and Charles Wesley's writings, Thanks. especially Sorry. Charles Wesley's hymns. So ironic, ironic then that Charles Wesley um, really strongly opposed the movement when uh, he was one of the key um, inspirations for it. Thanks. I have a question from uh, Mike Lodal. So we'll go to uh, the west coast of the States. Uh, Mike, oh, look, you look very comfortable, Michael. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you, Jordan. Uh, a quick comment and then a question. Um, I'd, I'd only encountered this language of a third blessing that I can recall one other time. Some of you might know or remember that William James actually alludes to this in uh, varieties of religious experience, uh, just like a, almost the way you typified it earlier. I know that he throws out that phrase and I remember reading it and thinking, really? I never heard of such a thing. And uh, I, although I don't know for sure whether he's specifically referring to uh, the same phenomenon that you are. Uh, my question is, you one of the uh, testimonies was, uh, I now see the Trinity and unity I remember writing that down and I've been interested in just recently the the extent to which Wesley seemed fascinated by the possibility of this sort of direct experience of God specifically as triune. And so my question is simply, is there much overlap um, in, in those sort of, we could say different interests uh, but but with your the sanctification of the mind, is there very much reference to sort of direct experience of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or are these pretty much distinct kinds of uh, you know pursuits or ideals? Just curious about that. Yeah, thanks, um, and thanks for joining us. I wouldn't say it's very prominent, but I think there are at least two two others who use Trinitarian language um, around their testimonies to the third blessing. Um, so yeah, so it is It is certainly there. There is a lot of language of God speaking directly to them. Um, and so that's quite prominent in most of the testimonies. It's often a, a scriptural verse being spoken to them by God, uh, but sometimes it is a, it is a vision either in, of their, uh, in their mind's eye or uh, in a dream or something where they, they seem to see, see uh, the vision. Um, so there is quite a lot of mystical experience and language uh, on the whole there. Um, one of the things I think that's a little bit difficult in the testimonies is it's not always clear uh, whether they're talking about God the Father or God the Son uh, in the language. Um, sometimes it's hard to sort of parse that out. They just, they all, they, the most common designation they use is Lord, and it's not always clear uh, exactly how they're, how they're using that, that name. Uh, thanks, Jordan. We've got a, a question from um, David Stark. David. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Jordan. It's so nice to see some of your faces again. Uh, I do want to return back to Stephen Wright's uh, question and commentary on why this is such a little known and addressed topic. Uh, and to that, I would say, well, my goodness, the second blessing has already been hard enough for so many of us to deal with, let alone add the third into the mix. I won't conduct a poll now, but I will confess to be someone at an earlier age who sought this second blessing. And then what do you do when the joys of that moment dissipate, right? As we know with Wesley, you, you cannot 
live off the laurels of your greatest moments, nor are you necessarily defined by your weakest ones either. For me to understand Wesley, the key was to hearken in to his late revision in the 1750s on perfections and missibility. And really that is, well, the, the state of graces, any, uh, any state of graces, a missibility. It's ability to be lost, but importantly, also regained. It can be sustained, but even if it isn't, that doesn't take away from the sincerity or the realness in Wesley's mind of what happened before, and most importantly, what can happen again. Now, there's been a lot of gurus before Wesley and many since after who have emphasized the significance of the now. But in his Ordo Salutis, uh, I see Wesley as the Christian spiritualist, spiritualist version of that. And so for me, it's easy to get caught up, or at least it was, in the firstness of grace or the second work, and now adding thirdness to the mix. But with the missability I see in John Wesley, in fact, I still hear the voice of a man long since gone reminding me to awaken to the constancy of availability of awesomeness in the moment. In fact, I can see Wesley as in this concept of a missability, which leads itself to the nowness of opportunity as having a voice that extends well, well beyond Wesleyan Methodism and perhaps even beyond Christian spirituality itself. Ironically, because of thirdness, for me, it puts any sense of sequencing as a back burner issue. Never mind firstness, secondness, or thirdness. Wesley is ultimately that great reminder of the nowness of grace and that each one of us can cooperate in this. So sure, Wesley might have publicly came out against it and then more privately seeing these Methodists find something within, he's honoring it and encouraging it. And I think that's best understood not as some grand scheme of sequencing, but more so that he took the opportunities of the present moment so seriously. Uh, and for me, that is, that is what continues to make Wesley a viable voice today for so many. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much. You, you knocked that presentation on our work out of the park. And thank you officially for working with me on this. Yeah, thank you, David. Yeah, there's more in the longer paper on uh, some of the points you were making, um, you know, Wesley made a number of statements that uh, about, don't worry about the terminology, just experience God in the present moment. Call it what you will. <laughs> yes. Folks, I, 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 we have a few more wanting to ask questions. So I realize some of you will need to go. But if I can ask them to be brief, the first from uh, Chizomo. Chizomo, you have a question? Have you a question, Tizamo? Yeah, yeah, Go yes, ahead. please. Uh, th thanks, Jordan, for for the question, uh, for for the presentation. My question is: What personal testimony do you personally have in relation to uh, the third blessing? Thank you. Um, I don't think I have a personal testimony that I can give at the moment. So I've been learning about it and uh, exploring it really through this research, not exactly for the first time, but because um, because of David's thesis, but for the first time in a kind of personal way. Um, so I, yeah, I do find it um, challenging, inspirational. Um, you know, these um, Methodists are dead, um, yet they are alive in Christ, and they are part of the great cloud of witnesses who um, testify to Christ today. And so I, I think certainly their um, intense pursuit of holiness um, is, I think, something that uh, can be an aspiration, an inspiration for, for all of us. Thanks, Jordan. I, I, I'm two, two more questions coming. A brief one from John and then Dulcie. John. Thanks, Jordan. Feel free to um, 
ignore this one for now and you can tell me more about it another time but i was i'd just be fascinated to hear more about in what ways charles wesley's views were different on the second and third blessing and for what reasons yeah um can maybe address some of that briefly um charles particularly uh in he wrote a, a hymn book in 1762 uh, which um, goes through almost all the Old and New Testament and uh, puts uh, hymns to scripture. Mm -hmm. And in that, he published that intentionally against um, the proliferation of experiences of instantaneous entire sanctification. So the instantaneousness was one aspect that Charles strongly objected to, maybe even the central thing Charles advocated a slow progressive sanctification over one's lifetime and uh, believe that one was usually not entirely sanctified until uh, the moment or near the moment of their death. Um, Charles um, was also quite concerned about um, some who had already fairly quickly um, expressed uh, a missability in their own experience that um, they had received this grace and had fallen away from it. Um, Charles was um, also concerned about the difficulties with pride in those who publicly testified to the experience. Um, and so he was um, concerned that possibly even just testifying to it itself was uh, an indication of pride amongst um, the individuals that uh, made those testimonies. Um, to that point, I'd, if, I don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to add, I think Charles may have had some practical concerns as well. Uh, I don't think it's any coincidence that Methodism took some of its most dominant steps towards securing its own denominational and dissenting status in wake of the controversy. In, and for Charles, that was the worst thing that could have ever happened. And so I think on a practical level too, he was much more adamant about slowing this down uh, because of how it affected Church of England relations. Yeah, the Anglican evangelicals were extremely disturbed by the holiness revival. And so that was certainly one of Charles's concerns that um, this could lead to division um, and separation from the Church of England. Thanks, Jordan and, uh, and David. One last question. Uh, Dulcie, uh, coming over to you for a question. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Really enjoyed your, your presentation. Really stimulating and uh, I'd love to hear more. Uh, my yeah. question really is to do with, um, I think I heard you say the third blessing was maybe a precursor to the Pentecostal emphasis on glossolalia, speaking in, in tongues. I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about uh, what might have been influential to then glossolalia perhaps be more prominent than this doctrine of sanctification of the mind? Yeah, well, um, I think it's a, it's a debatable point, but I think in the broad sense, um, you could see it as a, a, an experience beyond that of entire sanctification, mm -hmm. um, which glossolalia was for uh, many early Pentecostals. So the longing for something to continue to grow in grace beyond um, that experience of entire sanctification. So there's certainly commonality there. Um, I'm not aware of any of the early Pentecostals knowing about this aspect of early Methodism. So I don't know that we can draw a direct connection. I think it's, um, you know, it mostly died away during Wesley's lifetime. Although I do know of one reference of Mary Bosenke still uh, teaching the third blessing in 1796, I think it was. So that's after Wesley's death. That's the latest uh, reference that I've seen to it still being alive in, in early Methodism. So I think it's um, there's a separation because it wasn't a movement that continued, uh, as far as I'm aware, at least in the same way, um, directly related to the 1760s in the 19th century. So there's a there's a kind of gap there between um, the third blessing in early Methodism and glossolalia and early Pentecostalism. Hmm. Thanks, Jordan. 
I'm sure we could ask further questions and keep ourselves here till the morning, but our, our allotted time has run out. And thank you all for your uh, involvement and your, uh, your engagement with this. Uh, Jordan, thanks so much for what is a really stimulating paper. Um, and uh, our thanks to you, uh, our, our muted clap thanks, but nonetheless heartfelt for that. Jordan, do you thank want to you. say anything about uh, next week's uh, uh, presentation? Yes, uh, we will have